Good morning, everyone. Welcome on a Sunday morning. Oh my gosh, can't believe you have joined us so early. I'm going to be interviewing one of the most giving people that I know, Mark Painter. He's also the guru when it comes to practice management coding and billing. I recently posted a question on the Thriving Urology Practice uh, Space Group uh, announcement, really, not a question, an announcement that. Uh, uh, vasectomy new patient is actually a 99204, a level four new patient. Boy, that stroke a lot of inf uh, a lot of discussion, and some people have uh, agreed and disagreed and things like that. And uh, in interestingly, some people wanted the entire template when it comes to uh, how to document a, a level four E and M. I think some of the questions centered around history of present illness and physical examination. So I asked Mark if he would just come on here and explain to us how this works and he is so gracious to again so giving of his time and he is uh, truly here to help all of us so thank you for doing this mark oh thank you and the kind introduction all right let's uh y you i have pretty much read everything that uh, the painters have written for over 10 years and uh, you you guys are really doing a great job when it comes to branding brand building because you are the urology household name when it comes to coding and billing. Um, let's uh, get uh, right into it. Um, first of all, on your website, it says that we help physicians and their staff maximize reimbursement and compensation for success. And I think you have done a really, really good job in uh, that regard. So I really appreciate all that you've done. Well, thank you. It's been a uh been an interesting process getting through all of this but you know it, it, it I think part of all that 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 mission statement really goes back to the fact of you know when we when we started dealing with coding and reimbursement one of the things we did focus on early was compliance and we're still there and one of the things I think people don't get with a compliance program is that a compliance program is really about making sure that you accurately report all the services that you provide to your patients. And that maximizes your reimbursement. It kind of goes hand in glove with everything. And you know, as we've stepped through all this stuff, we always emphasize medical necessity and doing things right. Um, and if you do things right, you'll, you'll actually get to the right spot. And that's, you know, a, a good focus for any practice. I think a lot of people don't realize everybody's so afraid of audits. Uh, can you speak a little bit about audits? Sure. Um, basically, my attitude towards audits is bring them on. Um, you know, if you have you you understand what's what you're doing and you're doing things uh, with appropriate medical necessity across the board and practicing medicine the way most of you are, um, you, the audits are something that are going to happen. Um, they happen in multiple ways. They happen with medical record requests, they happen in formal audits, um, they, they happen with Medicare Advantage plans trying to dig for extra money for rack, risk adjustment factors. So um, there's no way that you can actually behave coding wise to avoid an audit. So you might as well embrace the fact that they're coming. Um, and that's really the basis of, of anything that all your records are there for people to see. So code and build the way you, you, you actually practice. I can't agree with you more. And uh, those who are watching, Karen, Chuck, and Fred, uh, please feel free to ask any questions you may have. I'm going to read your comments, and then then I'll ask Mark uh, during, during this interview. And what you said is something that is not said enough um, when it comes to E&M coding and billing. It's medical necessity, doing things that are only medically necessary and, and nothing more. And, and as you've taught in the courses for so many years, that is really the overarching theme that that covers everything and supersedes everything. Yes, it is, and it should always be. Just because you can't, you can uh, somehow code and bill it doesn't mean that you should. That's right. You need to, you need to introduce that medical necessity. That's that's where people get in trouble. Uh, quite frankly, as if they're doing things that they know they shouldn't do. Okay, let's uh, get into the. Uh, new patient, new vasectomy patient, HPI. And um, I know history of present illness for, for hopefully everybody, we only need four elements in history of present illness to reach a, a level five. Um, I think a lot of people are struggling with 
some of the four elements in history of prison illness? Okay, so a quick review. Um, so the, there are eight possible par- portions of, the, of HPI, um, location, severity, quality, timing, duration, and I got the context, modifying factors, and then uh, associated signs and symptoms. And you got to realize that I think in, in the practice of medicine, that negatives and positives are important when you're looking at a patient and you're thinking about what you're going to do for the patient. So as you record uh, a history of present illness, and we'll then obviously since vasectomy is the topic here, um, you've got to look at, at, at what questions are you going to ask about that patient and think about whether or not they fit within the HPI. So, you know, some of the questions that you're going to consider before you provide a vasectomy to a patient are going to be, you know, how many kids do they have? How long have they been married? Um, you're going to, you're, when was the last child born? Um, what kind of birth control are they using right now? What kind of birth control is their wife using right now? And what kind of lifestyle changes are going to make? And then are they healthy enough? Um, you know, do they have fever, chills, any of those things? So if you look at just asking those loca- th- those questions, you, you could obviously infer that location is there. I mean, you know where the problem is located and the problem itself is unwanted fertility, right? So, um, but you've got easily both timing and duration, you know, how long have they been married? When was their last child? How many kids do they have? Which are uh, also, you know, how many kids they have would also potentially be considered context. Context is also something, what, what kind of birth control is their wife using? Um, Cause that's out of their control. Modifying factors would be what kind of birth control they're using right now. And of course, their overall health is associated signs and symptoms. So um, even if they're negative, because that's a relevant part of all of this. So you've actually hit probably five of those uh, HPI elements um, with a, a sense of location, if you want to consider that, but you've got duration, timing, context, modifying factors, and associated signs and symptoms. So you've got a lot of different pieces of HPI easily laid out in asking the questions that you need to know and you need to discuss with the patient before they get a vasectomy. That is beautiful. All right, so I <clears throat> I have on the screen um, history of present illness elements for undesired fertility. That so undesired fertility will be, be will be the problem and chief complaint or patient's wards will be I don't want to have any kids or I'm done having children. Those will be patient wards. And on for location, obviously, is the scrotum and timing. You already mentioned when was the last child and things like that. Duration, how many months or years has he contemplated a vasectomy or undesired fertility and context. It was obvious. It's obviously during sexual activity or the other thing regarding context that I ask is, has the patient had a vasectomy in the past? So if the patient has had a vasectomy or not a vasectomy, if this is a redo, that's part of context. Modern firing factors, as you mentioned, type of contraception that he used, and associated signs and symptoms such as fever, chills, erectile dysfunction, penile pain, etc. So those are some of the things that uh, that people can ask in HPI to easily satisfy the four elements to reach a level five. Yep, agreed. All right, let's talk about switch on over to uh, a physical examination. Before I do that, those of you who are watching live, if you have any questions. Uh, please leave them in the comments, and I will ask Mark during the uh, during the interview. Hey, Doug. Hey, Olympia. Thanks for watching. Let's go over physical examination. All right, for 1995 versus 1997, a lot. Of, I think a lot of people are, are stuck on on using 97 guidelines. When I posted that comment regarding level four for uh, vasectomy new patient, uh, not realize not realizing that 1995 guidelines are a lot easier when it comes to reaching the necessary eight systems. Can you comment about that? So there's, there's a couple of different things that I'd add on the physical exam for those that are, that are considering where this fits. So um, number one, um, without a doubt, as you mentioned, the 95 guidelines are a lot easier. You need eight systems with one comment per system. Um, 
So that alone is a fairly easy thing to do, but actually is something that most urologists will do observationally. Um, and ultimately, when you think again, back to that medical necessity, you want to make sure you have a healthy patient um, before you get a vasectomy. You're going to need to know what type of issues they may or may not have in the recovery period if you're going to provide a service for them. Um, so, you know, if you, you know, thinking first on the 1995 physical exam guidelines, you know, you're going to get their vitals. Um, you're going to observe how they're breathing. Um, you're going to look and see if they have circulatory problems with clubbing or edema and those types of things. You want to know if they're ambulatory or not. Um, you know, you're definitely going to do a quick uh, GU physical exam. Um, you can certainly decide, you know, if you want to do the examination of their, you know, uh, barely poke their bellies, if they've got any problems with their, you know, pain in their spleen or those types of things. You look at whether they have any skin conditions or maybe other issues that would affect the healing process. Um, so um, all of those things add up to, you know, eight different systems. Um, so you've got a fairly easy route there in the observable physical exam that you would do just generally making sure that a patient is healthy enough to get to, to have a vasectomy, to undergo a, a, an office procedure. Um, then if you flip it over to the 97 guidelines and you're stuck with that in your compliance program, um, you know, that one's a, a much harder one to do um, from an overall relationship to the, to the vasectomy itself. But I would argue um, that there are a number of practices whose uh, medical philosophy is the first time I see a patient, I'm going to do a physical examination regardless of what their problems are because I need to know their overall physical health and, and they'll deal with that and that's where that medical necessity comes into play. So um, I think there's a little bit of a difference in philosophy depending on which uh, physical exam you adopted and from the from the practice side. You know, we always recommend that people adopt the physical examination that's the 95 physical exam. It's a, it's a lot easier to do and, and actually when you think about how the 97 guidelines came into play, um, they were really much more uh, relative to uh, uh, a, a residency exam uh, and, or something like that, which has been one of the problems overall and one of the reasons that they allow for both 95 and 97. But those are a couple of things to consider on the physical exam. Basically, for those who understand the rules for 95 exam, as you intimated, often a urologist can, simp a urologist can simply watch the patient and get eight systems and be able to document one comment on each system. And as you mentioned before, a positive is just as important as is a negative. For, for me, when it comes to uh, vasectomies, we get the vital signs. I can't tell you how many patients that I have diagnosed with undiagnosed uh, hypertension. These guys are, these young, healthy guys in their 30s are coming in with uh, blood pressures, diastolic blood pressures, well over 100, and, and on multiple measures, both automatic and manual. Some of these guys have come back to tell me, thank you so much for saving my life uh, because I took their blood pressure. Some, some of these guys are missing a limb. Some of these guys have, you know, are morbidly obese. And when I do the, the scrotal examination, and I think the scrotal exam is, should be part of the, the new patient new vasectomy patient evaluation because I kind of need to know the anatomy and some of these guys, ha you know, obese guys have really, uh, they're difficult, the vas deferens are difficult to feel. So I document all that. And to make the visit unique, uh, I document the type of underwear that they wear because each encounter has to be, has to stand by itself and you want to make it a unique type of encounter. So depending on the number of kids that they have, their body habitus, uh, who's present during the examination? I document all that. Also, the type of underwear that he wears. So I became I became a connoisseur of men's underwear recently. <laughs> but anyway, it's the bottom line is it's very easy to get eight systems in using the ninety five guideline without any sort of a major undertaking when it comes to physical examination. Um, 
Doug and Vera and Sarah, if you guys have any questions, uh, please uh, type them in the comments and I will be sure to ask Mark. So we've gone over HPI, we've gone over the physical examination, and uh, what you know while you're here, while I have you, why don't you uh, kind of explain to the audience uh, medical necessity when it comes to a 99204 for a vasectomy new patient? Sure. So, so you know, again, on the medical necessity side, kind of the best proxy proxy for medical necessity is medical decision making. So, this is a new patient, with which means you've got a new problem um, for the patient that's presented to you. Their problem of undesired fertility. Um, so, that's a level four for the presenting problem. You're not going to need any additional workup um, on this patient other than the discussion with the patient. So that doesn't bring it to a level five. So it's a level four. Um, the data is, is most likely very limited for you. So we're going to not use the, the data element in medical decision-making for a vasectomy patient. Typically you may get a UA, most people don't. Um, but um, so you're not going to have data. So we'll skip that element. The third element is risk. Um, and as you know, um, a cystoscopy, a diagnostic cystoscopy is level four. Um, prescription drug management is level four. Um, and a, as is a, a, a minor pr or elective procedure with identified risk factors. So um, all of those things would say, relatively speaking, a vasectomy fits in that level four category for a risk category, for a risk as well. Um, so uh, I, in the end, with, with two out of the three elements hitting a level four, um, I, I don't think level that medical decision-making is your issue. It's whether or not you documented the physical exam and how you documented your history is really going to decide what, which support of which level of code you have. <clears throat> Boy, so many people struggle with, with, with all three elements, history, uh, physical examination, and, um, and medical decision-making. I think uh, that what you just said kind of really, really uh, clear things up. Um, to summarize, when it comes to medical decision making, we only need two out of the three elements. And you mentioned number of problems, which is a new problem requiring no additional workup. That's a level four. And then in the um, in the risk section, diagnostic endoscopy is considered a, a level four. And certainly a vasectomy is no less risky than a diagnostic endoscopy. So easily it's a level four when it comes to uh, uh, the risk section. So now you have number of problems and risk, both level four, you discount data because usually we don't have a lot of data. Easily in the medical decision making, that's a level four for a vasectomy new patient. Agreed. Yeah. I mean, it's, I don't see any issues there. I really don't. Um, I've definitely had a couple of folks argue with me that they say that this is, you know, maybe fits into the level three risk category based on the fact that it's a, it's a, a minor elective procedure with no identified risk factors um, because you've got a healthy male. But um, in the end, there are risk factors um, as I see it um, with the vasectomy, both to the patient and to the physician um, in providing that service. And really, if you, if you weigh it in, relative to the other procedures that you do and where you would count those, vasectomy fits in that four for a risk. Yeah, it is. Even though, you know, I, I do a lot of vasectomies. I, this year, I'll probably hit close to 900 vasectomies. It is just because it's easy for me doesn't mean that it's low risk or is low value. Uh, just like a cystoscopy, just because it's easy for a urologist, we've done tens of thousands probably, uh, each of us, just because it's easy, it doesn't mean that it's without risk. And really, when it comes to ENM, you just have to follow the guidelines, uh, the prototypical things that are outlined in medical decision making. Um, and once you understand that, it's pretty easy when it comes to reaching the level that you want. Karen Brown says that we do make alerts for patients that have a history of easy, be easily being vasovagal. Sometimes the patient or the spouse will mention that he faints easily or he fainted when they try to draw his blood. And that's a, that's a clue, of course, uh, for us. That's a great, slightly greater risk. And the other thing is when it comes to uh, vasectomies, I offer a bunch of different ways uh, to kind of make the experience a lot more pleasant, including the use of nitrous oxide, sometimes very rarely IV sedation in the office, 
and uh, lastly, just oral med medical therapy, uh, anxiolytic. So those are, you know, before you pre prescribe e any of those, you kind of need to assess whether or not the patient is an eligible candidate, and that's why a history, a physical examination, <clears throat> are both so important. Absolutely agree. I mean, that's that's part of what you're doing. I mean, you have to consider the patient as a whole, even though what you're doing is very targeted um, from a technique standpoint. I mean, the, but the reality is you, you, you always care for the patient as a whole. So you need to understand exactly where they are health wise and, 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 and actually, especially with the vasectomy, where they are mentally. Because um, there's, there is a lot going on with the vasectomy that you know, as you do so many of the, these things, you don't really think about the, or necessarily put the weight on a vasectomy that the individual having it does. I mean, that's a, it really is a life-changing event. It's a long-term decision and they need to understand the gravity of that. Um, that, you know, I think that definitely some people walk in and think that's, you know, we could just flip it around and, and, you know, do a reversal down the road, but that, that isn't as easy as, as everybody really seems to think and 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 so again the patient is a package you've got to consider everything and that's why you're paid on e m codes to think about all these things just because your experience allows you to do it quickly doesn't mean or shouldn't lessen the effort nor should it lessen what they're paying you for your cognitive services and and there's plenty of examples outside of medicine that people often don't think i mean if you think about what does a lawyer charge and how does a lawyer charge for their expertise? You know, how does a plumber charge for their expertise? They, I mean, they they, you, you get $60 conference calls with a plumber now that, I mean, it's, that's really what the e &M service is all about. It's, it's paying for your expertise, you know, paying for all of your training and all your experience uh, it, during that visit. Yeah. A lot of uh, urologists and physicians, uh, undervalue the that part the cognitive aspect the experience and and also the liability that you take on by rendering that diagnosis and pursuing a particular uh, treatment course exactly okay seeing no uh, questions uh, in the comments i'm going to ask you a little bit about this uh, uh painter foundation uh <laughs> very very much in line with what you all do uh it's part of, you know, you guys are constantly giving, giving, giving. Uh, this seems to be something else that you are giving to the future. So we've, you know, we have been trying to educate uh, residents uh, on coding and reimbursement, which is such a vital part of uh, any physician's practice and, and their life um, as they move forward. Uh, you know, it's, we live in a in an economy that requires that the finances support what you're trying to do medically. Um, and if you don't take care of the financial health of your practice, you're not going to be able to, to provide the care that you go into medicine to provide. Um, so over the years, we've we've tried many, many approaches on on ways to get this information uh, to the residences, uh, uh, to the residents as they go through, uh, their training to, to become urologists. And there's, there's such a small group. Um, there's, you know, there's only 300 or so, um, that graduate every year. Um, all of them are that, you know, uh, well, we won't say all of them, but virtually all of them are significantly in debt, um, as they go through and pay for medical school and they're not yet out making enough money. All of, a lot of them are, are actually in, in, you know, they have families and other expenses and they're trying to establish their life and their lifestyle. Um, and so it's been a, a difficult, and, and I, I, I should add, the other thing is it's hard for somebody who is in the, the thick of residency trying to learn medicine to, to really think beyond what they're trying to learn uh, and, and it's not always, or it has, and probably wasn't even part of your own, your own training, John, where, you know, the residence program actually talks to you about, you know, what your future life's going to be and how you got to pick out E and M codes and, and all the things that, that they need to do to understand the full package of being a physician. So, um, we started the, the residency foundation as a, 
a way to provide this training to the residents. Um, and uh, we are in the process of talking to a lot of the medical, the deans of the medical schools. Um, and we're working with various uh, physicians and even industry to try and get the, the support that we can now provide this um, to every resident in urology. Boy, that would be so helpful because uh, I came out of a medical school with uh, well, $225,000, $250,000 in debt. And I, the, gosh, Larry Carmichael, your former employee, <laughs> he was the one who initially introduced the residents to E&M coding. And I remember that it was an industry sponsored dinner and he was able to kind of briefly talk about E&M services. And that was pretty much my exposure until I left residency. And I was very fortunate in that I uh, started speaking with uh, one of the surgical coders in my residency and she would ask me about the procedure, what that is about. And so I was curious and I asked, well, what do you mean? Why do you need to know this? And that's how I learned about the, the CPT portion, the procedural coding portion of uh, medical billing. So I was very fortunate. Yeah. Um, and then through just being a sponge when it comes to coding and billing and reading pretty much everything that you uh, put out, painters put out, um, I kind of taught myself and also through attending a ton of the courses that you, uh, that you uh, put out, that you put on. So super well, helpful. Well, good. Well, hopefully we're able to help the residents a little bit sooner and give them a little, a little bit more of a foundation. And so they're, they're not walking into these things just completely blind and having to, to learn and juggle everything that they need to do. Give them, give them at least a little bit. And that's, and, and the, the, the course is, you know, an online course so that they can take it when they need to and fit it in where they need to. So, um, we're, you know, again, try if we can solve that, uh, that need there for everybody where we're, that's what we're trying to do. Speaking of online courses, uh, you have a couple of them coming up in the next few days. Uh, one of them is the uh, uh, Medicare update and the other one is uh, telemedicine opportunities. Can you give us a little preview of, about those? Sure. Um, so uh, the first one you mentioned, the Medicare update, you know, every year, Medicare has a final rule that comes out and there's always a few changes here and there. Um, this year is no exception, although the biggest changes that were announced this year are actually going to take effect in 2021. Um, but we'll talk about um, the impact of the final rule, including a little bit of a preview of what's going to happen with E&M coding in 2021. Um, but we're going to go over some of the immediate changes that are coming up, like uh, uh, the the AUC um, for the advanced uh, image the, the appropriate use criteria. criteria yep for the for advanced imaging and what you need to start looking at there stuff that you need to do or at least think about this year um, and get and, pr and prepping for 2021 for your E&M codes and then talk about some of the the changes to the RVU schedule that actually are going to affect payments um, for uh, 2020 so. Uh, we'll cover that. And then uh, in the telemedicine uh, uh, webinar, we're really going to go over some of the opportunities that you have right now to bill uh, Medicare patients uh, and then uh, dabble a little bit in some of the things that are available uh, telemed wise for you to charge the patient directly for maybe some of the things that are being covered um, by some of the private payers. So we'll touch a little bit on that. It is a you know, telemedicine is up and coming. Um, it is going to, uh, it is seen already as one of the ways we're going to solve the the shortage of physicians that we really have, given the po the population and how things are moving forward. Uh, we know we have an access issue. Um, urology is one. Now, I will say there's a couple of places in the country where it doesn't look like there's an access issue, but those are few and far between. Um, so, uh, we're going to cover that and the, the opportunities there. Uh, it, it, again, we're, we're in the early stages. It's a little bit pioneering. There's a lot of kinks within the telemeds uh, world, um, but it is evolving. And so we're going to we're going to go through some of the opportunities now uh, and then we'll probably follow it up with a few more opportunities and a few more uh, of web programs down the road. 
as we as we hone in on different techniques and and different ways to actually use uh, telemedicine in, in different practices because not everybody's going to be able to use it the same way. And I think uh, in the uh, just in the initial phase from Medicare, uh, the uh, telemedicine, the official name of telemedicine, it's uh, it's still a little bit onerous for a lot of practices. It has to be, you know, a lot of a lot of caveats. It has to be a health provider shortage area. It has to be at a, a specific place and things like that. But then telehealth, health, tele, tele health uh, Med- Medicare now covers over a hundred telehealth services. So yeah, it's actually telemedicine services. That's a hundred different. Oh, services. telemedicine. Okay. Right. Yeah. So telehealth is a much shorter list in there, um, and that's. But there are opportunities in urology, and we've run some scenarios up the flagpole of various medical directors, um, and we'll be and we'll share those with you. So there's some opportunity. Sounds great, and um, it, 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 just in case some uh, people are thinking, well, my medical assistants can do it. No, only only qualified professionals with an MPI can provide that service. It's definitely going to be the, the, the doc or the APP that's going to have to get on the phone to actually charge for those things. All right. Uh, seeing no, uh, no comments, uh, no questions in the comments area, I'm going to end this uh, interview. I want to thank you again, Mark, for uh, doing this on a, on a Sunday morning. I really appreciate it. You're welcome, John. And actually, I, I, did, I should mention that if, if anybody wants to sign up for the, the, uh, the webinars that we're doing this week, they're, they're on our website, prsnetwork.com. So, not, not to worry. I'm going to put the link in the video description so people won't have to uh, look for it. Awesome. Well, thank you very much, and, uh, and happy Sunday to you. All right. Thank you so much, Mark. All right. Have a good one. Bye-bye.